We've got a very distinguished panel here, uh, as you can see, for our next segment. That was certainly a, uh, uh, a lively and an informative, interesting uh, session we had with the uh, two FCC commissioners, and I know uh, this will be as well. Uh, so this session is titled really creatively, it took me a while to come up with this, but this is Perspectives on Hot Topic Communications uh, Issues, okay? Uh, and what I'm going to do, uh, those of you that were here earlier heard me say that I've got, uh, you've got these brochures, they have uh, fuller bi biographies, if you want more, there may even be uh, more complete biographies than you have here on the web, so with their indulgence, I'm going to just say a word or two quickly about each one uh, so we can get get started and uh, uh, that way we'll uh, move into it more quickly. I'm going to uh, introduce them alphabetically uh, here. And by the way, I want to mention that, uh, uh, so I don't forget, my colleague, uh, Free State Foundation senior fellow Seth Coopers, standing at the other podium, we may do a bit of, you know, something like, Brett Bear and Chris Wallace, or or you name it. I you know I mentioned earlier I've had a been a bit under the weather, so I thought if if I my voice gives out, uh, Seth is going to be there to chime in. And in fact, he I'm going to he's going to chime in anyway uh, later on. So thank thank you, Seth. Uh, so first we've got uh, Meredith uh, Baker. Uh, Meredith joined CTIA as president and CEO in June. 2014. I'll just point out that she served, uh, as almost everyone knows, as an FCC commissioner. Uh, and then prior to that, she served uh, in the Bush administration as acting assistant secretary of commerce for communication and information, as well as uh, acting administrator of NTIA. Uh, so those are just the highlights. So what I, what I would want to say about Meredith, I'm going to try and say something about each one, but, but what I always will recall about uh, Meredith is that sh she gave, if she doesn't recall, her first uh, speech as an FCC commissioner at a Free State Foundation event. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's true. And in order to do that, she flew back from South America and I think came straight from the airport uh, to that event and, and uh, looked a lot better than I did having been on the plane for 12 hours. Uh, so I've, I've always appreciated that, uh, among all the other things you've done. Uh, next, uh, Walter McCormick, of course, is president and CEO of the United States Telecom Association, uh, the nation's premier telecommunications industry trade association. Uh, Walter joined U U.S. Telecom in 2001. Uh, and since then, since he assumed that position, his motto has been, uh, keep on trucking. No, see, you, won't, you don't get that joke unless you've read your, your uh, brochure and know that prior to joining U.S. Telcom, he was the uh, leader, president of the American Trucking Association. Uh, now, the thing I'd just say about uh, Walter, uh, you know, and he's got all the other distinguished background, but I, I'm pretty sure this is right. I, you can get into trouble doing this, but I, th I think you have announced that you're retiring uh, at the end of this, is it the end of this year? So uh, I just want to be serious and say that, uh, you know, whether you've been on the same side as uh, Walter or the other side, uh, you know, and whatever the case may be, uh, I think everyone agrees uh, you've done a terrific job for the association, and uh, I, I'm not sure what's coming next, but that's a job well done. Uh, so next we've got Michael Powell. I think he must have been the former chair of the commission that Commissioner Clyburn was alluding to when she mentioned that in her, her remarks. Uh, uh, Michael uh, became president and CEO of NCTA, National Cable and Telecommunications Association, in, April 2011, he's former chair, as I just said, of the FCC, has been an FCC uh, commissioner. Uh, and, uh, you know, what I want to say about Michael, I guess, actually, 
I, I don't think I've ever said this publicly to him, but you know, from the time that he was uh, served on the commission as chair and commissioner, uh, to my way of thinking, he he wrote a lot of awfully good decisions, and I find myself citing them a lot, you know, to this day. So that's that's maybe one way of thinking about a legacy. Uh, well, maybe not if Randy May is citing them, but uh, <laughs> but anyway, uh, I do, and I appreciate your service. Uh, so next we've got uh, Brad Ramsey. Uh, Brad, as I just said a few minutes ago, is general counsel of the uh, uh, NARUC. Uh, it's been there 26 years. It, it, you know, we pulled down from someplace, uh, and uh, that's a heck of a long time. Uh, it must mean he's doing his job, uh, doing his job superbly uh, to to hold on that long. The thing I'll say about Brad, this won't mean anything to some of you, but I want to say it to Brad. Brad, I remember when there was a period when you were able to, you were sending out that daily. Uh, combination of what seemed to be a tip sheet and a gossip sheet, and it would it would tell us who had moved where or, or had a baby or so forth. And God, I miss that. That was terrific. I guess they said at Narook you can't do that anymore, but it but it it was terrific. Finally, and, and of course, last but not least, is my friend Nicole Turner Lee. Uh, and and Nicole has been here uh, at previous Free State Foundation events. I'm glad you're here again, uh, and she and I have had the privilege of participating in some panels recently together on Lifeline. It's always fun to be with her, and I appreciate Nicole's really enthusiasm uh, every time I've been with her. Uh, and I'm just going to use that as a segue to say to Nicole and the others here as well that we're, you know, we're going to, I'm going to keep you moving along. Don't feel offended if I say you've got to not that Nicole has ever filibustered, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm going to keep you moving, everyone moving uh, along. And, and thanks to everyone for being here. Okay, now what I'm going to do, uh, just to get us started, uh, is ask each of you just to take three minutes and no more. Uh, I want someone up front to uh, use a, a stopwatch, and this is going to be enforced. Take three minutes just to tell us what you think the single most important issue is uh, before the commission, or if you insist on doing a couple subparts, wrap them in uh, before the commission. And that'll give us a basis, I think, as we move forward more specifically into the issues. So I'm just going to go down the line, start with Meredith, and um, go ahead. Great. Randy, it's awesome to be here. It's terrific to see such an esteemed crowd, particularly nice to see some Tom talking in the crowd, it's nice to see you, Tom. But, um, so let me tell you, there's, a, there's no shortage of differing opinions on communications issues these days. Um, I know we're gonna get to lifeline <laughs> and privacy, net neutrality, we're gonna have, they're, they're gonna have their moment in this panel, but I wanted to um, talk about something optimistic and something that I firmly believe is gonna be <coughs> change, our, change our future, and that's what the FCC is going to hopefully do this summer, which is the Spectrum Frontiers proceeding. Um, this is going to be key, this is high band spectrum. Um, for, for the last, for the last, you know, as long as you've had your cell phone, we've been using um, spectrum under three gigahertz. Actually, when Michael was chair, it was probably spectrum under one gigahertz. We locked our engineers in a room. We invested a ton of money in, in R&D, and we figured out how to unlock the potential for high band spectrum. So instead of miles to a, cell, uh, miles to a tower, um, I think currently we have 600 megahertz under use in our entire wireless um, ecosystem. We're talking about 10,000 megahertz in the high band frequencies that we're going to be able to unlock the value of. This is um, huge bands as opposed to small slivers. We're talking about meters, not miles, to a base station. Think about a network in this room connected by um, base stations that are the size of a smoke alarm. Um, we're talking about 10 times the speed of our wireless networks for this high band, which is going to be the key to our 5G future. Um, 10 times the speed, 100 times more things connected, and a latency that's going to be five times better. So if you think about a 4G car, it'll stop in about 3.5 meters. Under a 5G connected car, it's going to stop in an inch. This is life-changing, and it is really important what the FCC is going to do this summer. 
Um, and we are particularly excited about this. We need simple rules because the technology on this is really difficult. So um, I would say the most important thing that the FCC is doing in an optimistic way is the high band spectrum frontiers proceeding. It's gonna be the key for our 5G leadership. The same reason that 700 megahertz and AWS was key to our 4G leadership. We were the first movers, we had the advantage. FCC moves this summer, we're gonna be the first leaders in 5G and we'll lead the world, which is key to our economic future. Good, uh, I'm an optimist uh, by nature, so it's good to start out with an optimistic uh, one. And Daniel, you're gonna keep time, are you keeping time? Okay, uh, so next, uh, Walter, what's the single most important issue from your perspective? Well, Randy, first of all, thank you for the very gracious introduction. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. I, I would like to suggest that there's kind of an overriding issue, and the overriding issue is this, is that historically, um, Congress has said to regulatory agencies that part of your public interest objective is to promote the industry, the full development of the industry that's under your jurisdiction. So if you just think about the transportation background, one of the public interest requirements of the FAA is to promote the full development of aviation. And in the 96 Act, Congress took that same approach. It really wanted that act to, to promote the full development of advanced telecommunications to all citizens of the United States. And in that act, Congress said, and if you, if you find that telecommunications is not being timely nor reasonably deployed, then you should look to eliminate barriers to entry. I, I think that one of the big challenges that the commission has in the coming year is to deal with the fact that there is a slowing of investment. I mean, facts are, are difficult. I know the chairman has challenged whether or not there is a slowing of investment, but he himself has said that he doesn't think that broadband is being timely and reasonably deployed. <coughs> And what we have seen is that in every year since the recession in 2009, there, was, there have been increases in broadband investment up until the consideration of the Title II proceeding. And in that year between 2012 and 2013, that was the first year that we saw investment slow, slowed from 9% down to 4%. And then the following year after it was adopted, investment actually dropped by four-tenths of a percent. And the environment for investment is, is challenging. It's challenging in that innovative business models have now been sort of put on the shelf because the industry has been told that if you operate a network, you can't have a two-sided market. You're limited in what you can charge for. In the privacy proceeding, the FCC is considering standards for, for ISPs that would be different than for the rest of the internet ecosystem, and Moody's has said that this will disadvantage those who operate networks. We have seen um, the discussion over Ben John and other innovative applications, and the commission exploring Walter, I'm, those. Walter, so excuse me, but you, I want you to wrap up. I'm going not sure over time. My so my basic, my basic line would be this. I would hope that the FCC, I think the biggest issue for the FCC in all these proceedings is to keep in mind that there is a need to focus on the importance of the full development of the telecommunications industry. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Michael? Uh, well, I'll be brief, because um, I look forward to the questions. I, I would say there are three proceedings that are of most significance to us. Obviously, the cable set-top box, all vid proceeding, the privacy proceeding, and I also think the ultimate resolution of the legal course of net neutrality uh, all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, I think what's most important is the interplay of all three, uh, which it ended, if all of those succeed as proposed, <coughs> It fundamentally puts the government imprimatur on a notion of competition that relegates infrastructure to not being a full and active and innovative competitive entrant in that, a competitor in that space uh, and biases the regulatory investment to the benefit uh, of technology companies and edge providers. And I don't think over time that's going to be a healthy framework for the country. Uh, but if you look at these proceedings and read them together, they fundamentally represent the view uh, that those types of companies should be permitted to compete and invade into our traditional spaces, but we should be constrained and re not allowed to enter into spaces in which they are dominant. And I think that will be solidified if all three of these things uh, come to full fruition. Okay, well, that's uh, helpful, and we're going to, uh, that's a basis for talking about uh, those proceedings, or some of them more specifically, too. 
Uh, Brad, uh, just take a couple of minutes on sure, the I'd single most important issue. Is this on? Uh, yeah. Uh, first, I wanted to thank you for inviting me. I was really honored by the invitation and was very pleased that I was going to be on a panel where I literally admire and respect every other single member of the panel and disagree with them on almost every issue. Uh, well, that's good. I wasn't sure that was hey, true, but we're going to uh, bring for, out for some of that. For no big surprise, the, the Congress in the 1996 Act set up a federal-state cooperative partnership uh, for, for implementing the entire statute. Uh, pieces of that have fallen away over the years. Uh, you would expect me to focus on the future of the federal-state partnership. So, of course, in the proceedings that are pending before the agency, the ones that I'm most interested in are contribution reform and what impact that will have on the complementary state universal service programs, high cost and otherwise. The lifeline proceeding, which as it's currently described to me, and I, I still don't have all the details, we've made a number of uh, meetings at the FCC, but it certainly, in its current form, will undermine state programs uh, and, and certainly make them less effective, and I think that will lead to additional fraud and abuse. And the third is a transitions docket, which depending on how the commission acts, there are a lot of related dockets uh, intertwined with that, will take stakes, uh, state cops off the beat in, in terms of oversight. One thing that I wanted to mention that was not, it was actually raised by uh, Commissioner Riley's comment on the last panel that frequently the FCC insults the statute. I just want to say in the last 30 years that I've been doing administrative law here in D.C., the FCC has insulted the statute with great frequency. And uh, something happened last week that I was very pleased to see. We're on the cusp. I cut my teeth. I started at NARIC in 1990, and I cut my teeth lobbying the first five years that led to the enactment of the 1996 Act. Everybody in this room has uh, a stake in what is starting probably started really last year, a year and a half ago. Uh, we're starting another five to ten to maybe 15 year cycle to revamp the entire federal uh, landscape in terms of the law, the federal law. We're starting that process again. And the problem I have now is uh, at the FCC, and this has been consistent throughout all the administrations since I've been doing this, at one time or another they will look at the policy they want to achieve and then they will basically rewrite, instead of using the tools in the statute to get to the, same, the place that they want to go, they'll rewrite the statute. Okay, well, why don't you uh, hold that thought, because we, okay. we may come back to rule of law issues, uh, which is our theme for this year's okay. conference. Hold that, and let's uh, have Nicole tell us about the single most important issue before the commission. Well, thank you, Randy, for having me. Uh, honored to be on this panel with these folks, and all of you who are here, thanks for taking your time out to be here. Um, I'm actually going to just echo, I think, some of the, I think the issues of importance to groups like MMTC have already been echoed. Um, in particular, the issue of foremost importance to us is obviously lifeline modernization because of its impact on low-income consumers. And moving forward, as we get into deeper conversation, our hope is that the lifeline reform will happen in a cautious way that looks at, it doesn't make the presumption that broadband will be ubiquitously available in all communities in three years. Uh, there's some real danger and concern about some of the um, ambivalence in those proposals that we at MMTC are looking at very carefully to ensure that low-income consumers actually benefit. But I want to use my last minute, if you don't mind, to say what is not on the critical issue list for the FCC, and that is diversity and localism. And if you don't mind, I'd like to just put in a plug here because I think it's really important. In all of the proceedings that we've seen before the FCC, whether it's in the set-top proposal proceeding, whether it's in spectrum policy, communities of color and other diverse entries small businesses and other new <coughs> types of businesses will not prosper. And it's very clear that the FCC is not taking diversity into account. Uh, the FCC's diversity committee is the only subcommittee at the agency that has not been rechartered in two years. That's a problem. This is an agency that is actually designed to ensure that the unintended consequences, particularly on minority programming, the unintended consequences in minority ownership of commercial wireless spectrum do not get discussed after the rulemaking has hit the floor, but those consequences are reviewed prior to. And so groups like ours, out of all the critical issues that are before us on the table, the one big thing that is missing is diversity. And we think that the FCC, as we talk about that, Randy, and all these other things, I'll bring it up. But that's my commercial, and I'm sticking with it. No, that, that's <laughs> fair enough. And I don't know whether you were here when we started with Commissioner Clyburn, and forget what it was, but she took the words out of my mouth in terms of uh, something I was going to say. And, and so, and I, and I read those words, but, I, you know, I have down here, uh, Nicole, the question for you. Uh, I appreciate that the interest of MMTC in the media and communications policy realm are broad, and your expertise is broad. 
but give the current commission a grade for, it, it's, for its attentiveness to the diversity agenda and briefly tell us why. So I'm, I'm glad you, you, you don't, don't say anything. Oh, I'm, I'm not saying nothing. I'm glad you, anticip <laughs> I'm glad you anticipated my uh, question and, and brought that up. Uh, okay, so uh, with that, uh, let's talk about some of these specific issues and, and uh, try and get a lot in. So the, the two that are up uh, at the commission uh, uh, shortly are Lifeline and, and Privacy. Uh, so what I want to do is just uh, with Lifeline, and, and Nicole said something, but I'm assuming that all of the panelists in a general way probably uh, favor the extension of the Lifeline program to broadband. If, if that's not true, you can say so. But what I want you to do is I'm going to go down the line and just tell us uh, briefly uh, whether what problems or a problem uh, that you have with the proposal as you under understand it. And let's just uh, see what they, they are. Uh, we, we can just... I, I'll alter it next time, but why don't we start with uh, Meredith and go down the line. Sure, Randy. You're right. Um, of course, we support the program. We support the shift to broadband, um, and we support improved program administration. <coughs> what, what has to be done is that it has to be done in a way that reflects the market realities and the consumer preference for mobile. And we, we risk right now something that is too fast to transition or mandates that are not based on mobile pricing or packaging in a degree that's going to lessen the program participation for consumers. And we hope that we can find some middle ground together on this. Uh, Walter? Uh, I mean, we if don't you, have any you know, on all these things, I should just say, if, you know, everyone won't have necessarily something to say about every, everything, but, but on Lifeline, if you have a problem with what the commission's doing, this is what we're doing now. Yeah, no, we don't have any uh, large problems with it. We think it made sense to, to expand it to broadband and reorient it that way. Our big objective was to try and streamline the program so that there would be a third party uh, national verifiable uh, certifier so that we wouldn't be administering the program. The commission's doing that, so we think that we're on, that they're in, um, taking the right direction on the program. Michael? Well, I think we're in violent agreement on the positives. I think um, these aren't negatives, but I think they're issues that the Commission has teed up. One is the sort of burdensome, complex uh, ETC certification process. I mean, I think one barrier for a lot of cable companies and the participation uh, in these lifeline programs have been the onerous uh, burdens of getting ETC qualified, uh, and we hope that the Commission, as they've suggested, uh, will go a substantial direction into uh, lightening that burden and attracting more uh, participants into the program. We also think that it's really important to permit access to lifeline support for different levels of service. Um, I, I continue to think the country's potentially making a mistake uh, by trying to establish uh, only a particular level of broadband provision as the only acceptable level and assuming that that one size fits all is unique to the unique geography and sociodemographics of the country. And I think that increasingly by promoting that vision, we lose the opportunity to increase access uh, through lower cost alternatives that might be less capability of the high end, but still would be extraordinarily valuable to someone who hasn't even been able to get online yet. And I hope we become more granular in the way that we do that. Brad. Well, <clears throat> I know you alluded uh, to something. Why don't, why don't you- I was about to say, it's, I don't, we don't have time to go into an extraordinary detail here, but there are state matching programs and there, there is state involvement in the designation procedure. And the optional procedure, at least as I understand it, uh, that was outlined in the fact sheet, it can only have one, one effect. It can undermine state matching programs. It can undermine state policing of the system. Uh, and that includes both for fraud and abuse and for uh, <coughs> service quality. Because a lot of times if you have problems with your lifeline service, you complain to the state commission and they'll come back and they have the option of pulling the ETC designation and cutting off your federal and state funding. Uh, so that goes away too through the national designator. I'm not sure exactly how the geographic designations that are required by the statute occur there in terms of determining if someone actually has the coverage to provide ETC on a, you know, it's, it's some kind of optional basis to provide, I guess, wherever you have facilities. Uh, and 
there are advertising requirements associated in the statute. It, 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 makes, it doesn't seem particularly consistent with the, the scheme that, that Congress set out. And I don't think, uh, I've heard the case when I've been at the FCC, there's been a lot of lobbying about how this could draw some large facilities-based carriers into the system that are not already there. Uh, let's just say I'm very skeptical uh, because, for example, in California, if, uh, if you weren't getting the state certification and you were only getting the national certification, why on earth would any carrier go in knowing that people that are certified already in California have a $13.50 advantage in offering service? Uh, it, it doesn't really compute. Okay, I, I should say uh, for the panelists now, since we're uh, getting in, uh, to these issues more specifically now, if, uh, if you do want to add something when we've gone down the line that's that's a response to someone says, then, then we can work some of those in, and that's part of what we want to do. So, uh, Nicole? Yeah, I'm not gonna um, speak specifically to Brad's comments on the states. I mean, we also think that the states play a huge role in lifeline administration, um, so I don't want to discount uh, what he said. But I do think on, on behalf of getting more consumers into the system and making the program much more cost efficient and program efficient, that it's important to streamline the eligibility verification process. Right now, an MMTC will be releasing a paper shortly with uh, Dr. Coleman Basilin on the cost of the administration of the Lifeline Fund are just extremely high. It's even higher than most federally managed programs. And so we have to figure out a way how to redirect some of that savings to open up the marketplace to more enhanced competition, while at the same time making sure we're going towards more coordinated enrollment to get at the waste, fraud, and abuse that is part of those program efficiencies. I think it's also important, and this is a conversation that came out in the House hearing just last Tuesday, that we're sensitive to this whole concept of skin in the game for low-income consumers. The people that we're trying to reach are already unbanked. They're already geographically isolated. They do not have the means to travel in their wheelchairs to places to re-up their lifeline card or benefit if that's the case. There's got to be some sensitivity there, and I know that was brought up a lot last tu this past Tuesday in terms of lifeline eligible consumers. Um, and I just want to keep reiterating, we're not there yet in the marketplace to assume that three years is enough time for the marketplace to be readily available where broadband becomes an eligible service over voice. Okay, uh, Brad? Well, I was just going to say, you know, we have, NARIC has endorsed by resolution the idea of some streamlining with the, with the verification process. So, I, you know, I agree with you. I didn't want to yeah, suggest there was a disagreement that there, yeah. I, uh, you know, so just a quick editorial comment. I won't do many of these, but, but you know, I, I've been a longtime supporter, actually, of the Lifeline program going way back before, you know, there was a proposal to expand it to broadband. Sometimes people say, you know, uh, you know, well, I, you're a free market uh, oriented person or, or, you know, I thought you were, uh, quote, conservative or, or whatever, and, and you support Lifeline, which I've done for a long time. And, and I, I'll just say, uh, and I have questions, and Nicole and I have been on panels, I said, where we've debated some of these, but I, you know, I, the reason I do it, uh, and I assume the same is true here, because in, to my mind, there's a legitimate role for safety net programs, really, and I consider this really a safety net program. I think it has to be properly structured to remain one, really, and, and not something else, but, but, and I've got, you know, my own questions, but, but for those of you that have asked sometimes, I, I do support uh, Lifeline and, and its expansion to broadband if it's implemented uh, in a proper way. Uh, okay, so if, uh, there's nothing more on that. Let's talk about privacy. Uh, that's another uh, controversial uh, issue, uh, I think. And uh, again, as you're thinking about these things and talking about them, you know, we've also got, and I think Michael uh, alluded to this earlier and, and others, there's, there's always the question of, of uh, the commission's lawful authority and how it does things in addition to policy issues, but I, I assume at some general level, again, you all agree that ISPs have some subscribers, uh, some ex, uh, uh, that ISP subscribers have some legitimate expectations concerning the privacy of their information. I assume that's probably uh, true. Uh, nevertheless, I, I know that uh, you probably also have concerns about the particular pro proposal that uh, Chairman Wheeler has put 
forward. Uh, and so I just want you to comment on uh, the, his proposal. And, uh, you know, I, I thought that that report, I confess I didn't read the whole thing, but I read some of it in the executive summary. I thought that that report by Peter Swire uh, from Georgia Tech, who's generally, I think, thought to be a, you know, a, a, a scholar in the field and with not, not a dog in the fight too much, as they say. What, you know, I thought that was kind of telling, but, but just comment on the chairman's proposal and what you, what you don't like about it. Let's try and focus on that. Uh, so I said we were going to go back the other way this time. We'll keep rotating it. Nicole? So I have to admit, too, Randy, I haven't gotten through the full document myself. But I, I would say this. I did read Peter's report, and I've looked at all of the, the draft proposal. And I really want to leave this to the industry folks to comment further. But I think the privacy concern is a, a very much resemblance of how the FCC is operating right now, where it is paying particular attention to regulated industries without looking at the ecology in a holistic sense. Um, clearly, people who are consumers do not have a fragmented experience on the internet. So you know, <coughs> putting particular rules on ISPs for their portion, their millisecond portion in some cases, of the internet experience is clearly, you know, without fault to the other providers that actually make up the entire ecology. So I think given the fact that we all want in this country, I think some of us have been in this room since early 90s <laughs> talking about policies around pri privacy, we all want to see a coherent glide path that keeps consumers' information safe. I don't think anybody in here, just like Lifeline the Forum, does not want to see that. But you can't parse up the internet. <laughs> to pick winners or losers or tighten down, you know, on, on certain aspects of it without looking at the entire user experience. Uh, Brad, do you have any problems with the proposal as you understand it? This you know, NARIC doesn't have a position yeah. on it. My only comment would be in the wake of the net neutrality order, it's something that they have to examine if you believe in the rule of law. I don't know that what's been suggested is uh, particularly good or a bad approach. I okay, that that's mean. fair enough. Uh, Michael, you probably do have some positions on it, I expect. No doubt. Um, look, what's interesting to me is privacy is not controversial. It's the hypocritical inconsistency of legal application that's controversial. Um, you can't describe, as the commission does, and as I heard Commissioner Clyburn during the parade of horribles associated with data collection and monetization of that data and, use, and say that's the justification for the depth, breadth, and intrusion of these level of rules, while ignoring the fact that that same level of activity behavior, probably by a factor of 10, takes place in the consumer experience on every other digital experience they have. Yet, that's not worrisome from a public policy position uh, because there are some benefits that go along with personalized data applications, um, and so those should be allowed to breathe and innovate and find a trade-off of balance between privacy and personalization, right? And then to turn around in another proceeding and say, but no, when that same activity is occurring with a company that we happen to regulate, um, we think it requires a heavy-handed approach uh, with uh, a priori specificity uh, around privacy. Now, I heard Commissioner Clyburn say something which I, I really do reject, which is, oh, well, we're just two different agencies and they have, um, <clears throat> they are complementary, they don't have rulemaking authority, so you can't compare us. But you forget that restraint is a regulatory tool as much as action is. And if you're taking an action, you certainly have, a, the commission certainly has available to it the choice to create a privacy regime for the companies that it oversees that is in consistent harmony with the privacy experience that consumers are having with other providers in the economy. You could make that choice. And in fact, the proposals that uh, we and others have put on the record essentially call for a pretty significant approach to pri privacy that does attempt to harmonize the experience. Because you can't convince me that when a computer, when a, when a consumer sits down at a computer and fires up Facebook, they make any distinction between what their expectation of privacy is, thinking about whether it's their Comcast ISP or it's Mark Zuckerberg collecting their data. It's, it's just nonsensical, it seems to me. Uh, and I think dodging that by saying, well, we're different regulatory authorities, doesn't, doesn't matter, uh, I think is a completely incomplete uh, justification for the action. 
Okay, well, I suspect that <clears throat> Walter and Meredith agree with uh, at least some uh, substantial part of what, what Michael said. So what, what I want to do uh, is just ask you if you have anything you want to say that, that adds uh, or differs from what he said, uh, do that, uh, and, and then we'll move to another issue. Yeah, the, I agree completely with Michael, and I would just have two points. The, the first, the, the commission statement that ISPs have some sort of unique eye into what the consumer is doing, I think is disproven not only by the Peter Swire paper, but also by what Mark Rotenberg of the Electronic Privacy Information Center said yesterday. He said it's just basically pure baloney that, to say that ISPs are some sort of unique gatekeeper. So the premises that the commission is moving on are premises that are just inaccurate. And Rotenberg says that he believes that agencies have a fundamental <coughs> responsibility to accurately present the problems that they seek to resolve. Secondly, I would say this. The White House itself has said that its agencies should provide the consumer with consistent expectations in this area. And what the FCC is doing is moving forward in a way that does not is not aimed at consumer protection, it's aimed at market regulation, and it is not going to give consumers consistent protection in the area. In fact, if anything, it is going to mislead consumers. It is going to deceive consumers to think that if they opt out in one circumstance or don't opt in to, to sharing of information that they are protected on the internet. And I think that that is just wrong for an agency to do. The consumers expect their federal government to speak with one voice in this area. Meredith. So, so I'd like to uh, underline, um, put it in all caps, and add exclamation points to what Michael and Walter and Nicole have said here. I think that we are obviously committed to consumer privacy, and I think that it's working very well under the FTC approach. Um, I, I hope that the FCC rejects the idea to treat ISPs differently. I think it's confusing to consumers, and it's very harmful to competition. I, if you read the Moody's report, it shows the magnitude of the harm of the proceeding that is taking place at the FCC. Um, the industry spent months on a proposal, months, and I think we went a lot further than a lot of people wanted to go in the room. We don't necessarily agree on a lot of things these days. We came out with an industry proposal that reflects the regulation aligned with the FTC approach. I hope that the FCC gives good and thoughtful, um, good and thoughtful time to this proceeding. I think we all need to take a look, take a breath. Privacy is important, consumers expect it, but we need to do this in a way that consumers understand and that won't harm competition. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that the FTC will take a good look at this framework. You know, Randy, if I could just add one point too, because yeah. the, the, the commission, and I've heard FCC commission, FTC commissioners try to make this argument too, that, well, the reason it's different is that a customer can choose not to use Facebook or choose not to use another service while they can't choose their ISP. First of all, you could take issue with the fact you can't choose any ISP. Um, but, but even so, that's, that's a red herring because can you choose to disconnect from every digital property? While you might choose not to go to Facebook, what is it that you're supposed to go to that you will gain greater privacy protection from? I mean, right. it, it is Google, Facebook, Amazon, eBay, everybody in that ecosystem is subject to a different set of rules. So the, the idea that you can choose one over another doesn't, doesn't in any way create a, an argument that that's a unique sp a space right. of choice. And I'd like to add <clears throat> just one thing. Keep in mind that what the chairman of the FCC has said is he has established a standard. He has said repeatedly this information belongs to the consumer. If that's the standard, if that's the standard that the lead federal agency in the federal government with regard to the internet has <coughs> set, then I think that it will be eventually inevitable for other agencies not to be able to abide by the same standard, that this information belongs to the consumer. So consumers are going to reasonably expect that that's the standard that the federal government has set and that there will be consistent standards across the board. So I think that the FCC does need to be very, very careful in this area to understand that whatever it does is it really is establishing a standard. It really is establishing a standard for the entire internet. Okay. Uh, Seth, uh, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to uh, formulate the next 
question, maybe on set top box, uh, the set top box proposal, because we want to, that's another one that draws some controversy. Uh, but in the meantime, while you're doing that, I, I, because Meredith is really the spectrum uh, expert uh, guru here, uh, I mean, that's her job, uh, if not her passion. So just take a moment. I know it could be, we'll do, we'll do another whole program on it uh, sometime, but take a, a moment uh, to the extent you didn't do it initially and just explain, you know, everyone keeps hearing about 5G, you know, five, we understand that's probably the next generation after four, but tell us why that's important and what policymakers, you know, just briefly need to do uh, so that we maintain uh, the, the lead and, and, you know, why it's important to, to fill the spectrum pipeline. Just give us the quick overview and let's commit to doing another spectrum program later. Let's do. Um, so spectrum, spectrum should be a national priority. It's important for all of our lives. Uh, it, the 5G is the next generation of our network. So if you think about 1G to 2G to 3G, that, that's, when, that's when you went from voice to text to broadband. And then in 4G, you actually can access the internet on your mobile device virtually anywhere you want, almost as fast as you want to. So what 5G is going to bring you is the internet of things to the extent that a Fitbit isn't doing that currently. It's going to have 100 times things more connected to the internet, 10 times faster speed. It's going to be high band and low band spectrum. What's been so important to us is our 4G lead. We lead the world in 4G. 98% of our people are covered by 4G networks, and that has created an ecosystem. They say 100 megahertz equals $30 billion to the economy and a million jobs. That's important. So it's important for us to maintain our lead in 5G. To do that, we need to continue two parallel tracks. One is continue the low band spectrum. We've got the incentive auction that's going to start on March 29th. Pretty important. I saw Blair Levin in the room. He should be congratulated on that. We also need high band spectrum, as I mentioned in my opening remarks. Um, these are two parallel tracks. High band spectrum is, is uh, the spectrum frontiers proceeding. If we lead the world in this, then we will lead the world in 5G. We've seen Japan, Korea, the European Union all wanting to take our lead. It's important for us to keep it. Thank you very much. And you mentioned the incentive auction. Uh, you know, we could, we could have some fun. We could have a little pool here just among friends. Uh, I'm going to go down the line, and I want you to tell me the the exact amount of uh, proceeds that are going to be raised in the incentive auction. Anyone want to do that? I wouldn't put you on the spot. Nobody. I, I, don't, I don't want to do that, Randy, but if it's okay, I want to say something about spectrum policy. Okay, but I think Matt, Meredith was about to give us the precise number. And the, I wasn't. I was going to say no matter oh. what the number is, it's going to be a big number. I, right. I think, you know, when people talk about only in billions, I, I, it makes me scratch my head. Um, it's going to be a big auction. People are going to show up with billions of dollars, and it's um, important for so many reasons, but including precedent setting. Well, that, that's encouraging uh, to hear that, and especially from, from you. Uh, so, Nicole, you wanted to add a word about yeah, spectrum just, policy? Yeah, just a quick thing on the incentive auction. I think Meredith kind of teed this up. So I think on the, um, I think a week away from the beginning bidding of this, um, we're all very excited about what the incentive auction is actually going to do to fill the, the spectrum gap, but to also generate income for, uh, revenue for this country. But I, again, want to go back to my original co uh, conversation about diversity, just real quickly. Um, after the repack, my friends, we also need to be cautious about minority media ownership and what that's actually going to look like in terms of the spread of channels and the localism and diversity that's going to be represented. Um, you know, the FCC right now has a vacant channel proposal, which is pretty controversial in terms of an unprecedented move for uh, uh, unlicensed over content, particularly those ones that we'll be selling. And we also have these opportunities, which I think um, we're we're, ant we're anticipating, so this poll, Randy, I can say the anticipation of minority media ownership in the incentive auction will probably be very little, <laughs> if at all. And given that, because of the lack of access to capital, it's also very important, I just want to say this in 30 seconds, that we cultivate a market of secondary, a secondary market transaction so that people can build capital to compete in these auctions. That continues to be a, a problem, though it requires very little government in, uh, uh, intervention and very little government regulation and very little government incentive to actually create a, a very healthy the secondary market for minority and small businesses to actually gain the access they need to get into these kinds of things. Good. Well, thanks for um, 
adding that. I appreciate it. Uh, Seth, why don't you uh, ask the next question? Okay. Uh, to my panel, since I snuck into the co-moderator sidekick podium here, I just wanted to say welcome. And I'll, I'll jump right into uh, the set-top box question. Um, you know, last year, uh, the FCC issued its effective competition order. And it looked at the cable market and, and said, you know, the situation's changed from, from years ago. We've got competition now. We can presume uh, that, that cable services uh, serve uh, people in, a, in an effectively competitive environment. And so it granted sort of presumptive relief from uh, a series of uh, rate regulations that included uh, cable operator provided uh, equipment and devices. And then to flash forward, uh, the FCC has just uh, proposed a new set of uh, video device rules uh, called, frequently still called, referred to as Allvid, but it's, it's a very different kind of proposal in some ways from 2010. So I'd be interested in getting the panelists' take on this um, in terms of, you know, starting with you perhaps, um, Michael Powell, what's the, what are one or two of the most problematic aspects of this proposal uh, from your point of view? Well, thank you. This will be the one proposal I'm long-winded on. So, forewarning. Um, to me, this, this proceeding perfectly encapsulates the concerns about unjustified uh, market engineering and intervention, uh, perhaps more than any. And I think it so systematically violates uh, principles of regulatory restraint that have been well worked up over the course of decades. Uh, principle one is it's intervening in a highly and well-functioning market. You cannot find one soul who doesn't recognize that there's probably no more robust, uh, tectonically shifting market than video delivery. When this statute was passed, the cable industry had 94% market share of multi-channel video. There was no existence of DBS in any measure. Telcos were not video providers. Um, in the intervening period, uh, that industry, cable industry has lost 50, over 50% 50 in market share of that market uh, to new entrants. Um, in addition, you've had the invention through the internet of streaming capability, which has brought in an enormous amount uh, of competitive alternatives in streaming services, not the least of which being Netflix, who in the course of five years goes to the Consumer Electronics Show and announces they're a global empire with more subscribers than any cable company in the United States. Um, this market is on fire, and even when you turn to boxes such as they are, the proliferation of boxes, whether it be Apple TV, to Amazon Fire, um, to Roku, continue to spill out into the market uh, unrestrained. So it's hard to understand that anybody could find anything that looks like a market failure. In fact, the Commission's own video competition report is one of the few that sings glowingly about the level of video activity. So that's a violation. It's using an outdated law and going well beyond its original parameters. I heard Commissioner Riley talk about the fact that it's equipment. This is not living constitution stuff. That is a statutory word intended for a statutory purpose. Equipment um, is one thing, and the cable industry acknowledges that there's a role for third-party equipment. What the commission is doing is not creating competition in equipment. It's creating an entirely new video service using the inputs and resources owned and belonging to others violating a third principle, which is the respect for private property and intellectual property. Because to allow somebody as formidable and as wealthy as Google to access the intellectual property of others for free, as opposed to negotiate for it, in order to build a creative video service, uh, is just a rent transfer, pure and simple. Uh, and not for public purposes, uh, for commercial purposes of one over the other. And I think that uh, is also a, a, an ill of this proceeding. It really does pick winners and losers. Uh, let me just tie that to privacy. It's astounding to me to listen to the commission talk about how important it is to do all of this privacy stuff. But in all vid, where video distributors today are subject to privacy protections that include not disclosing consumer data without prior written consent of our, of our subscribers, uh, and ensuring that they have a, uh, a right to contest even government requests for their information, uh, including providing them a federal right of action in court to protect those interests. But if that content gets ported over to a Google box, those privacy protections vanish, and the Commission seems untroubled 
by that fact. So change your input and you will completely change your privacy protections and expectations. There's no other explanation of that than favoring one for the other. And then Randy, just to wrap up, if you expect cost benefit analysis, a simple application here would show that the costs so dramatically exceed uh, the chimerical illusory benefits uh, that the commission has proffered. It will be expensive, it requires network re-engineering, it will require consumers to have a new device, all those costs will be borne by them, uh, and it won't even come to fruition for five or six years, at which time this market will have blown long past uh, these dated and rearward looking ideas. Okay, well thanks for that, I, I just have a quick follow up. What, what do you really think about uh, the, the chairman's, <laughs> chairman's proposal? No, don't. Uh, no, th thanks for that because it, it does raise a number of issues. I'm, I'm going to uh, pass on uh, any more comment on that because I think Michael uh, covered a lot of ground there and I want to cover just a couple more uh, issues uh, and I'm going to ask the next question then Seth, uh, maybe you can uh, tee up one more after that and we'll maybe try and get a question from the audience. Uh, to stay fairly close to schedule. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've pointed out, you may have been here when I was talking about the rule of law with uh, commissioners O'Reilly and, and Clyburn. It's something I've been writing about really uh, over the past year, year and a half because it, it did seem to me that a number of uh, uh, proceedings of the commission and the way they were handled uh, raised issues uh, with respect to what I call rule of law norms or, or principles. So, uh, but uh, you can you can find those somewhere. Here's the question I just want to ask because it's you know it's at the heart. It's an important part of this open internet proceeding appeal. Uh, thank God it did. The decision wasn't handed down today, so that all of you'd be reading on your uh, on your devices. Uh, uh, you know the question of the president's involvement through the video and 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 the statement uh, is one that's been much discussed. It was part of the argument in the D.C. Circuit, I think Judge Tatel asked a question, basically in connection with, you know, with there seemed to be a, a you know, a, an abrupt switch or a switch in the direction the commission was going to take, and he was asking about the role of the, the president, and the, uh, the what I want to ask you is, is similar to what I asked the commissioners. Uh, Michael, you, you of course <laughs> were chair of the commission and a commissioner. Uh, I, I just want you to talk about whether you think the process, to stay away from completely the substance ultimately of where they came out, but did, did the president's involvement uh, and then what happened at the FCC in connection with it, does that raise rule of law concerns there, that are uh, serious and, and not frivolous or, or not, really. You want to start, Michael? And I, I'm going to ask everyone to be pretty pretty brief on, on this. Well, I'll try to be quick. I mean, in my own opinion, it does. Because the FCC as an independent agency has to abide by one central administrative legal principle, which is their decision <coughs> is premised and premised solely on uh, the substantial evidence of a whole of the record that's before them. Um, when the president um, uh, expresses an opinion, which of course he's entitled to do, uh, but to do it by YouTube video, uh, and by the way, that's not all it included. It included visitations to the commission by the chief economic advisors to the president um, after the record was closed, um, without any opportunity for other participants to respond to any of the arguments that were presented. It is naive in the extreme to pretend that uh, commissioners who are politically appointed uh, aren't unduly influenced by the President of the United States taking such a dramatic and focused uh, direction on a particular proceeding, um, particularly given the timing of that proceeding. Yes, the administration often expresses its view. Uh, it usually expresses that view through a filing uh, put, in, put in record by the Commerce Department or the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department, written and on the record and subject to review. Did you not get any videos when you were Never ever got a video, and I can honestly yeah. tell I never got a phone call. Um, so look, e even if it didn't do it, it, it certainly created a taint. Um, by the way, I think that if you want any evidence of that, Judge Tatel's questioning 
uh, of Jonathan Salad about what made you change your mind, what made you change your mind. The NPRM proposed something very different. Uh, the chairman's own blogs and statements that suggested a completely different direction. Uh, and only after the intervention did we get a different result. And even the court raised questions about why that happened. I think, unfortunately, it sets a bad precedent. And I think the, the gloves are off in the future uh, that any administration will feel that, president, that political forces can intervene in the White House, try to bring political pressure on the commission in that way. And that raises questions about the independent virtue uh, of having an administrative agency in the first place. We might as well have a secretary of communication let everything be done Okay, uh, well, thanks for that, that answer. Um, so it's an important question. I'm just going to ask whether any of the other panelists have something uh, succinct, succinct they want to add to what Michael said, pro or con, plus or minus. Anyone else want to say anything? Maybe, do, do, don't take too long to decide. Just uh, you want yeah, to. I was, was going to say quickly. I mean, in, in respect to our president, of which we have the highest, utmost respect for his actions generally, it, it does give the appearance of a degraded public engagement process. Um, just recently, with the Lifeline proposals that were issued by the FCC, no more than two hours later or the next day, the White House issued a uh, statement affirming that decision and was told, you know, basically told many of the stakeholders that they had gone through a public engagement process of which all the groups that I'm aligned with were not <coughs> invited. So I think you, you, you have to really be careful of towing this line as an independent agency where you want sufficient input before decisions are made. You need sufficient query and deliberations before you go to a rulemaking, and that's something that we continue to see back up from the White House. Did you want to add anything, Meredith? I was just going to say that, that we're really focused on working with Congress on a, a framework that's going to work um, a bipartisan uh, on investment and innovation, and we need, we need a bipartisan solution. We need Congress to act, and, and we're focused on looking forward. Okay. Uh, I'm, because I said so early, I'm going to ask Seth to ask one final question, uh, if he has one, and then... What I'm going to do, because we always do it when we can, it's our, our tradition. We're going to we're going to uh, go to the audience for questions uh, for a question or two. But uh, I I want to point out so I don't forget. And by the way, it's a terrific crowd here. I think uh, I think our staff ordered a, some more some more lunches. Uh, we're behind that wall. If you've been here before, we have a we have a very nice buffet uh, lunch. It's uh, probably almost as nice. Don't repeat this, but as, uh, you know, what we had at my daughter's wedding. Uh, so, uh, it's not true. But anyway, it's behind that wall. We're, so here's what we're going to do, and, and uh, Michael mentioned John Sallett. Uh, you should stay, because I'm going to ask him during my lunch conversation about some of these things, uh, of course. Uh, so we're going to uh, finish up here. Then Commissioner Olhouse is here, uh, Maureen. We appreciate it. She's going to give us a, a privacy thing, and I've I've got to keep adhering to time. And then we're going to have lunch uh, at that buffet, and then I'm going to have a conversation with John Sallet. So, with that, Seth, do you have a final question? Yes, I do. Uh, the FCC's municipal broadband order swept away North Carolina and Tennessee laws concerning where and under what conditions uh, its own municipal governments could become uh, providers of broadband internet services. And so those states have challenged that order uh, in court and it's been argued before the Sixth Circuit where it's been claimed the FCC lacks authority under seven sec section 706 uh, to preempt the states on that. And Brad, I wanted to get your take on that. Um, what's what's Nehruk's position on this matter? And um, if you have any perspective on the oral argument of the Sixth Circuit. Well, the oral, I can go straight to the oral argument. It was pretty clear that one judge understood. It wasn't, one judge didn't say anything. And, and the other judge, I wasn't exactly sure the direction she was going. I still would be very surprised if any three judge any circuit would want to take, uh, would want to uphold the FCC in these circumstances, given the, the, the precedent from the Supreme Court in Nixon. I look at this case, this is basically the FCC telling the state whether or not it's going to get into the broad business, broadband business and, and where. The problem with the FCC's analysis is that it treats the state and the state organs 
uh, as two separate entities. Uh, you know, basically it says, state, you're, this uh, subdivision of the state is not really part of you, it's an independent entity and you can't tell it what to do. It's completely flawed analysis. I don't think if it does go to the Supreme Court that they'll ever get to the Tenth Amendment issue, but I did a memo on Tenth Amendment issues about, oh gosh, 20 years ago, and the only thing that's left is you can't tell the state what they're going to do. You can offer them money, but you can't. So I, I, I'd be very surprised if this gets uh, upheld at the Sixth Circuit. And if it does, I predict very, with as much confidence as I have in the federal judiciary, which granted is not a lot, uh, if it'll go to the Supreme Court and get reversed if they do. Okay, well, I, I think that's straight from uh, the horse's mouth, someone that's been doing this uh, state representation and issues of state sovereignty for over a quarter of a century, as I said earlier. So what I want to do is take uh, maybe one question. Uh, you raise your hand. While, while, I, uh, while we're doing this, uh, the lady with the microphone back there uh, is Kathy Baker, and she's our events coordinator. So let, would you join me and give her a, a quick round of applause? Kathy, make sure we have enough food. No, I think, I know we do. Uh, okay, does anyone have a uh, question here? Okay, this gentleman, state your, your name and affiliation and just ask a question. Uh, my name is Rich Shockey. I'm a voiceover IP engineer. I'd like to go back to the question of lifeline and high cost issues. What I would like to know, and I think a lot of people in this room want to know is, how are you going to pay for it? The existing system for funding Lifeline in high cost areas is based on long distance voice, and we all know what that problem is. Okay, uh, that's a good question. I, I guess the commissioners have departed here now, but uh, who wants to take a stab at that? Well, I'm on the federal state joint board staff anyway. Okay. And of course, we're obviously looking at comprehensive reform of the funding mechanism which, if you've been paying attention to the press, Commissioner Rosenworcel has indicated, will wait at least until the net neutrality decision comes out, which hopefully will be soon. Uh, but there are others that suspect it might, uh, are suspicious that it might take a little bit longer than that uh, in terms of getting a, uh, but the joint board actually is meeting and uh, we are discussing the issues. Okay, uh, so what I want to do, this has been terrific. I, I, I wish we had more time, but we're going to, we'll do it again. Uh, as soon as uh, this panel departs, uh, Commissioner Olhausen's going to come up immediately and uh, speak uh, for about 15 or 20 minutes at most. And then we're going to uh, have lunch again. We're going to open up the uh, buffet. And uh, I'm going to have some fun during that lunch conversation with uh, John Salad, I expect. So. Uh, yeah, I hope you'll be there for that. So join me now in uh, thanking this distinguished panel, if you would. Thank you.